<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of Rockhammer, a warm welcome to the drummer and founder and legend of Motorhead, Mr. Lucas Fox. Hey, nice to see you. Excellent. Excellent. Really, really pleased to be here on Rockhammer. Um, welcome, gals and guys. N really nice to, to, well, I can't see you, but you can see me, so that's a start. <laughs> that's cool. I've got the right T-shirt on as well. Never, never seen without it. Absolutely. I've got the, well, I hope you wash it occasionally. And the tat as well. My <laughs> Absolutely. The ink. We like the ink. Done a nice job there. There's there's one slight change actually. The iron cross is actually missing from the bottom, and it was replaced. You know, I had to be a little bit PC, so it's replaced with an ace of spades instead, just to be right on. Well, I can understand that. I mean, uh, that was Le one of Lemmy's additions when Joe Patagno produced the first version of Snaggletooth, and uh, I was sitting on the sofa with Joe Patagno between me and between me and Lemmy in Doug Smith's the manager's office. And uh, he brought out a big brown envelope with two versions of what he thought would be a good logo. And uh, Lemmy's finger came out and just went, that one. But I want it much dirtier. I want it much more raunchy. And mm -hmm. so he yeah. added the spikes on top of the head and he yep. added the iron cross hanging from the, the tusk. And he also added the, the, the dripping like a alien, that saliva dripping. Yeah, I'll do that. So, uh, it's, it's more of an age thing these days. <laughs> <laughs> so in, can I ask you, because I was I was going to do a Wikipedia uh, fact, a Wikipedia fact check. Always helps if I get my teeth in, doesn't it? Um, did you actually, did you really pick uh, Lemmy up from the airport in 75 when he was fired from? Yep. Yes, absolutely. In May 75. Wow. Fantastic. And also... And on, but but, but we've, we've been hanging out for a long time before that, um, whenever he wasn't on, on tour, because he was on tour a fuck of a lot in, in 74 and uh, recording and stuff. But every time he wasn't, um, we were hanging out because we had so much in common. We met at the speakeasy through Motorcycle Irene, who introduced us. And uh, from that moment on, we were, we were pretty much hanging out regularly because we just had so much in common, although we had... Uh, six years difference between our ages um it's it was it was uncanny because uh well i think the first conversation we probably started talking about well humor was the first one where he told me a tommy cooper joke in typical lemmy style um just like and then, that just like that just like that, just like that. and um and the second thing we got stuck into was talking about um British R&B and, &B. and uh, we, we, we went through them and we went through um, all sorts of bands that, you know, the birds obviously and leaving here and stuff like that and we started talking about that and it's really mystified me because um, he was obviously in the space rock band at the time, Hawkwind and uh, it surprised me that uh, we had the same tastes in this British R&B movement which was years before um, and so we, we, we really got started talking about that. Um, once we'd sort of, you know, aligned that bit, we, we then started talking about Second World War and, and he surprised me and I surprised him that both of us were um, very learned, I'd say, on the Second World War. Um, mm. That it'd be my, one of my obsessions since about the age of 12 or something. Because um, my mother was on a base that sent all the SOE agents out to France and she was uh, the commander of the base in 1943 from the, on the women's side but it wasn't looking after the admin which I thought for years and years until a couple of years ago three years ago I saw her on a film on Tempsford which was the base and uh, I saw her from the back unmistakably under, unmistakably my mum and uh, and she was she was putting um, all the missions on the board and so therefore she was actually operational um, and I visited Tempsford um, last year, and not you last year, for, for a couple of years ago, and, uh, and and spent some time on the base. Very interesting stuff. So 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 I was completely into that, 
and also being at a French lycée, which makes a lot of people go, well, how the fuck did you get into Motorhead coming with that education and all that stuff? Yeah. And, um, and of course, that's, that's also a, a story at some point worth recounting. Um, I'm writing my book at the moment. So I was going to ask that. about that. How's that going, actually? It's going really well. It's, it's, it's kind of scary and weird and stuff because I've never really looked over my shoulder into my past before. And, um, and it was only, well, after, uh, really after Lemmy's death that suddenly everyone realised that there was another guy at the, at the beginning of <laughs> Motorhead. And, uh, and certainly so, not forgotten for my generation because uh, you know I, I'm well aware that it was it was Larry Wallace, Lucas Fox, and Lemmy, the original. Well, the order's different, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The audio, the audio, the order was the other way around, where it was you know it was literally me and Lem, yeah. or Lem and I, <laughs> and uh, and and that's that all started as I say in '74, and uh, so when he finally got kicked out of Hawkwind. Uh, he was an absolute train wreck and I picked him up from the airport. And th then we spent, I think, about two weeks, two and a half weeks together where he didn't really want to see anybody. He was so pissed off. He was so angry. As you would and, be. Uh, eh? as, as you would be. As one would be, as, as I certainly was <laughs> at the other end. Um, but, but yeah, and, 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 so, and so, I don't know, it's, it's that strange thing that... Uh, um, so many men are educated into being in constant, in constant competition with each other. And, and I didn't have that thing, you know, because of the way I was educated and, and the, the women that brought me up um, and the girlfriends, because I had a lot of girlfriends who were older than me. And they really taught me how, <laughs> how to make <laughs> love and, 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 and all that stuff. So, so there were a lot of things in common, including... Uh, our respect for women and uh, and love love of horses because he rode horses, I rode horses. So didn't you know that really? Yeah, when he when he was a kid, he he, he used to love to go go to the local stables, um, and he started pulling girls at the local stables and stuff. And uh, but he loved horses same as I did. We loved to ride horses. We never actually rode together, which is a shame because that would have been fun. Yeah, but. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised so he, he didn't saddle up for the cover of Ace of Spades. Actually, that would have been, it, been a bit. Well, well, exactly, and and and, and I think that, uh, that 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 probably happened, like a lot of things with Motorhead, as a kind of um, well thought out, last minute thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, but but what they should have done, it's probably because Filthy and, and Eddie didn't didn't ride horses. So so uh, you know, I, I can imagine that uh, that they both you know sat on that idea if it if it ever happened. I'm sure they both rode a lot of things, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> just, <Yeah. laughs> not, just, just not it with four legs. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So the idea behind our show is this is the second annual um, Motorhead Mayhem. And it's uh, last year it went absolutely viral. We got it shared by Motorhead Worldwide, which is cool. And what I want to do is put this interview up. I uh, should put this up on the web soon. And I wondered if you would be able to talk about a couple of tracks that we're going to be playing. Uh, namely, we're going to be playing Lost Johnny. And wondered if you wanted to do an intro to that when we play it on the show. Of course. Um, yeah. I mean, it's an interesting one because this album, as you've, have you actually got this album or should I get it sent up to you? Oh, that would be wonderful if you could. Yeah. Uh, I, I will. I'll just make a note of that one second. Um, because what I'll do is, is I'll, I'll dedicate it to you or to the station or whatever you want me to do. Thank you. But, but, but what's interesting about it is when Warner, Warner Brothers got hold of me um, to, because uh, they were writing the liner notes. And um, so, so I sort of said, okay, well, you know, s send me the mastered version of the album, remastered version of the album. And I listened to it and I thought, that's very interesting because I hadn't heard it for, you know, 30 years or 35 years, something, long time. And uh, I started listening to it and I, I recognized on most of the tracks, I could hear the cloon of my snare drum. That's Larry's term for cloon because my snare drum, I didn't dampen it off completely to, to, to make a complete crack. Um, and I, I had this cloon sound, which was like a bit of a ring to it, which Dave Edmonds, the producer, actually loved because it meant that he could use that because it would it, this sound would cut through the rest of the sound. And he didn't have to have the, the snare drum that loud, making this, the bass and the guitar much, much more powerful sounding. 
Sure. So, um, so I started listening to the whole, all, all the tracks on, on the new, new remastered expanded version and realized that my clune was in there. And of course I thought about it, I thought about the way it was recorded. Rockfield at the time didn't have, didn't have a drum booth. Okay, this is the clue. And therefore what was recorded was also recorded with overhead mics all the way down the studio to get big sound. So the original drum kit is actually on all the tracks I played on. So there's two drummers on the original tracks that I played on. There's me yep, and, there's, and there's Filthy, apart from on Lost Johnny where Filthy wasn't available or no, where, where they said that they liked the version as, as it was. Sure. So, 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 but we can come to that if you like at, towards the end of this where we can talk about Rockfield sessions and all that. Okay. It, 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 it is part of what is interesting about this. You, you wanted to me to introduce Lost Johnny. So here is Lost Johnny, one of my favorite tracks of all time. And I still love that, that uh, the guitar sound that Dave Edmonds got and also those, those wonderful um, octave licks that, um, that Larry did, which, which I, th I just think that they still stick in my mind as something incredible. Uh, as something really, really a real hook, sure. you know, as they say, a real hook. <laughs> and uh, so, so Lost Johnny, Lost Johnny, the original version. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. And the other one, which almost never gets airplay, but I love ripping the rule book up on Rock Hammer. I mean, I've played 12 minute tracks and things that just, uh, is one reason it's successful is because I tend to play the tracks that aren't the go to tracks, you know, not like most rock radio stations. We're actually pitched above that. Uh, we play heavier than them and we play the, the, the non go to tracks. So I'm going <laughs> to hit you with this one. We're going to be playing Vibrator. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there, there, there's another good track, um, which which is an interesting one. But uh, yeah, so, so, so <laughs> here is Vibrator. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, actually, the, the, the bit that does worry me slightly is it, it's I'm a v -v -v vibrator, greased and ready to go, which is very 70s rock and roll, isn't it? You know, greased, really? I mean, now it would be hypoallergenic uh, <laughs> lubricants. <laughs> <laughs> well, well yeah, yes, because cause motors are now, you know, motors are now run by computers, uh, whereas at the time it was all, it was all grease and... Um, Hell, and, uh, yeah, Greece was uh, the only thing available then. <laughs> it was good enough for them. <laughs> so when about is your book coming out then? Because I'm, I'm intrigued and I'm so looking forward to reading it. Uh, it'll be coming out in, I think, well, it'll be coming out next year, I think, because I'm writing the French version first, which um, I was educated in French from four to 17, so it's a natural language, and I've been living in France for 30 years or so. That was my and next so question, that, actually. So, yeah. so, next so, question, so, uh, how long have you been living in France? Well, there you are. <laughs> you got the answer already. Um, so, so, um, so, so, yes, the English version will be coming out in, in, in 2022 as well, um, because I've got to rewrite it in English, because I, I refuse to have somebody translate for me, either way, into French or into English, which, of course, means I've shot myself in the foot, because I've... Instead of writing one book, I've got to write two, and it's the same subject. But um, it's not for the faint-hearted. Anybody who's faint-hearted, don't buy the book. Um, it will warts be, and all, is it? I hope so. Oh, completely warts and all, and it's it'll be totally subjective, uh, which may displease people, but fuck them, I don't care. Um, <laughs> when I started thinking of writing the book, I thought, well, all the books I've read, and that's a lot, you know, including White Line Fever, which is a great book, uh, good read and all the rest of it, and uh, Keith Richards' life and all you know, lots and lots of biographies. But they always sound like it's a journalist talking about what it is. I've rarely read books that actually go into what it felt like uh, to be living it and to be doing it in that state and the sort of drugs we were taking and the sort of life we were living. Uh, and, you know, frankly, most books talk about the rock and roll and the rock and roll they talk about is like, oh, I put five strings on my guitar instead of six and I did open tuning, which is all very good if you're a musician and find that interesting. But in the end, I don't find that very interesting because, you know, OK, all right, we've got that, you know, we, we can understand that. But what I really want to know when I'm reading a book about somebody, anybody, is what it felt like to be that 
that person. Um, you know, the smell of the squats, uh, the dealers, the, uh, the cockroaches on the wall, the sticky carpet in the pub, um, you know, what people were talking to each other about, um, you know, what the kids were wearing. Um, and I mean kids, you know, the youngsters, you know, of, of sort of, you know, four to, four, to, uh, four to eight year olds who were basically copies of their parents, you know, with these wonderful little flared jeans and stuff. All that stuff is, is what I think, well, it's, it's, it's what I have to write anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the way I'm writing it. It's, I, I couldn't write it like a journalist would write it because I'm not a journalist, journalist. But what everybody's told me is that they love the idea of just plunging back into the 1970s and particularly what Labrick Grove and Notting Hill Gate and Portobello Road felt like living in it, living inside this, this, I mean, Labrick Grove for me was a, it is, well, was a character in itself in the book in the same as way as Hammersmith Odeon, where I started going to the Hammersmith Odeon, I must've been 11 for the um, Beatles Christmas show. And it's called another Cre Beatles Christmas show. And here is my ticket. There it is. Oh, wow. How amazing. My, that must have been like your local, was it? If you, it was my if, local. I, I was living in Chiswick at the time. Okay. And, uh, and, and there were all, so, so we, went, we went to the Hammersmith Odeon a lot, including things like this, which also changed Chuck my life. Berry show, my Chuck, goodness, Chuck man. Berry show at Hammersmith Odeon, you see. Um, so, so, so that's when I started going to Hammersmith Odeon. And, um, and saw, saw shitloads of, of bands there and, and, and the stacks, uh, um, the Motown show as well. Uh, just amazing shows, amazing shows with lots of bands on them. Um, and so, so when it finally came round to playing Hammersmith Odeon, support to Blue Oyster Cult, there were these flashbacks, which I had as we came down from the dressing room, remembering and seeing the stage beneath me remembering all the other people I'd seen on that stage. And it was finally, finally, I've got to walk on this stage. <laughs> what a moment for you. What an incredible yeah. moment. And obviously, but, like, but, but likewise, the roundhouse where I went a lot and likewise, the marquee. Yeah. Um, you know, all, all these, these mythical places, mm. um, which, which I ended up also playing with, with Motorhead or, or with other, other bands, you know, um, the Warsaw Pack playing the Red Cow or, or, you know, Oxford Uni and stuff like that. So it, it's been a it's it's an interesting one plunging back into all of this my past because I've never really done that I've always been heading forwards and, and always thinking about well what's next yeah and I find it interesting that you're you're quite open to you know discussion about the way you you did obviously crash out of Motorhead in the same sort of way that Lemmy did from Hawkwind and it's kind of refreshing that you don't mind touching on that you know. If well, you, I guess you're going to do that in the book as well. Oh, oh absolutely. I, I mean, um, what can I say? One of my attitudes to that is that um, <clears throat> much as I loved Lemmy, because he was really like a big brother, big uncle to me at 22. You know, it's, it's a big difference. Um, and I've been going to Speakeasy for four years then because I lied about my age to get my membership card <laughs> and managed to get it. <laughs> and... Uh, <clears throat> And that's how I started learning about um, this other world, which, of course, you know, the rock gentry was living in. And I had to learn about this to start breaking through in my own way, because um, I wanted to be a drummer since the age of nine, where I started washing cars to buy drum kits in right. the street at the age of nine. And uh, so it was a natural progression through, through all of that. So um, <clears throat> crashing out a motorhead, um, the amphetamines, I'm sorry to say, amphetamines don't really suit most people. Um, when you start taking them in, uh, to that extent, um, the number of people who actually survive that um, are, are not that many. And, you know, I buried maybe 15 friends in the 70s um, of various overdoses on various drugs. And, um, and there, there is a thing about this. I mean, Lemmy in 74, 75 was almost on a, on a mission, almost a vocation to get people to take amphetamines because as far as he was concerned, sleeping was a waste of time. <laughs> and he wanted everybody to be on his, uh, in, in his own world. He was also extremely frustrated 
by Hawkwind, who were obviously smoking dope all the time and taking acid all the time, which he did for a long time in Hawkwind, but he got bored with it. And, uh, and he started really wanting to, you know, to, to live a different life. So he was living in, in, in a different time zone to what Hawkwind was. So that also um, drove him to, um, to want to, to, to you know, uh, his favorite drug, which of course came also from um, Pervertine um, of the German army on Pervertine, which was their speed, which meant that they could do the Blitzkrieg, which meant they invaded Europe much, much faster than any, any other army had ever done in, in the history of mankind. And Pervertine, therefore, after the war, was what um, most of Germany was hooked on because they, they started with the pilots in the Spanish Civil War, <clears throat> where the German Air Force were, were, were bombing um, in Spain. And then they, they used it um, on, on, therefore, the crack troops, all the, all the elite divisions, um, both tanks, aircraft, and uh, Waffen SS units using this drug pervertine. After the war, Oh, oh, and the submarines as well, the U-boats, to keep them going so that they could do very, very long hours. Britain did the same thing with Benzedrin uh, with, for their pilots. Um, so it, it wasn't unique to Germany. But after the war, therefore, Germany was hooked on pervertine. And when you talk about the Beatles playing, playing the Star Club Hamburg, uh, they were play, playing to a whole bunch of people who were also still on pervertine because it was still rife in those days. Um, then you can take it away, all the way back into, into Britain with um, you know, all the early 60s bands, The Who. Um, Keith Moon was dealing speed to The Who. <laughs> um, so, so, so it's... Surprise. You, know, <laughs> you, you can understand Lemmy's addiction better. Yeah. Because it was, because it was part of what was done. And it was part of, um, if you like, the myth of... of, of you know, just constantly keeping going, keeping going, keeping going. I'm guessing so, he was the he was obviously the um, he was the exception, not the norm on speed. By the sounds of it. Well, yeah, I mean, Lemmy was one of the only people I knew who became normal on speed. <laughs> <laughs> and when he wasn't on speed, he slept. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so uh, that was every you know three or four days. So so, so I, I lived that life with Lemmy for um, for the time we were together. And, and obviously, particularly for the, um, from the month of May, when, when he came back and I picked him up all the way through to December when, when I spun out the other end. Yeah, yeah. So are you working on, apart from the book, is there any other projects you're working on at the moment? I know you've had a really, really busy, busy life working with various musicians over the years. Um, oh, yeah, and various musicians and various other things. Um, I mean, running shows. I ran shows for Medem, which is the biggest music convention in the world. I ran their shows for three years, live TV 50, uh, to 15 countries, live TV with live bands. That was great. That was very exciting. Um, then I ran shows in um, uh, New York um, for French bands, exporting French bands, because I got pissed off with um, everyone saying, oh, there's no good music coming out of France. And I just knew different. It reminded of me a bit of sitting at the age of 10 or 11 in my, my parents' uh, house in Chiswick in, in the dining room on my drum kit, banging away. And this American couple came to dinner with my parents and the, the, uh, the, the, the man of the couple uh, kind of leant against the doorway in a suave way and said, uh, oh, you're a, you're a really fine drummer, August, but uh, you can forget it. You know, you limeys will never, never be able to swing like the Americans do. We're in 62 or 63, just before the British invasion of America happened with the Beatles, the Stones, the Who, et cetera, et cetera, the Kinks, et cetera, you know, all yeah, the yeah. wonderful bands we know. And, and of course, that just stuck in my gullet. I was thinking, you fucking arrogant bastard. This, this is not going to... And of course, you know, I was proved, proven right. Yeah, yeah. Um, likewise, everybody always said, oh, Johnny Halliday. Well, yes, Johnny Halliday is a, is a poor copy. That was Francis Cliff Richard. You know, I'm sorry, but Cliff Richard had one good track. Probably I'm the only one or something. 
Um, but but it, you know, there is a the reason rest, Cliff, Cliff, has, Cliff has been blown up. I have I have a cheesy act that gets blown up at the start of every Rock Hammer show, and Cliff is he's been there on more than one occasion. <laughs> <laughs> I think right. he, get, he gets through two bars of Living Doll before the dynamite goes off. Just a wacky. <laughs> Well, well, it's not, it's not, it's not like the Devil in Disguise, is it? Which was one of the first tracks that turned me on. You know, yeah. you look like an angel. I mean, come on, that's not Cliff. You know, no. I got wise. You're the Devil in Disguise. Yeah, yes, you are. You know, and that's 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 a track. That's a fucking track. You know, such an engaging chat. Appreciated. My, my pleasure, Stevie. It really is. And and to you, all you gals and guys out there, you know, keep rocking. Keep the faith and stay safe you know you've only got one life you know try and keep your hearing because <laughs> i managed to keep mine if i can you can